everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. And you join me first of all in the space plane hangar where we're building a fairly unusual looking aircraft, or at least it will be fairly unusual in just a second when we add this massive fuselage constructed mainly of batteries. We've got 17 of the big batteries with a thousand units of electric charge as well as three more in that little fairing piece at the front of the aircraft with some RTGs inside the fairing as well. The reason we've got such a ludicrous amount of batteries is because this is going to be an ion powered SSTO. And ion engines are something I've not done, I've, I've very rarely used because they are very tedious. They've got incredibly low TWR. They make, you know, they make the nuclear engines look like vectors, to be honest. Um, and, you know, they are quite complicated because they don't just use the liquid fuel and oxidizer. Instead, they use the xenon gas and indeed electric charge. So it's a slightly different system to what a lot of players are generally used to. So it's kind of these things I don't tend to use them. But I decided I would this week because I had an idea for a lathe SSTO. You see, well, I guess all lathe SSTOs have somewhat of a barrier to entry because SSTOs, especially interplanetary ones, can be quite tricky to design in this game. And when you're going for an unrefueled mission with an SSTO to somewhere very far away like lathe, you have to do a big series of gravity assists in order to make sure you have enough fuel to do the mission. Typically with Lathe and Elu and whatever SSTO is that far out, you have to do a gravity assist off EVE, then off Kerbin, and then off Kerbin again to gain the velocity you need without expending too much fuel such that you'd run out before you uh, complete your mission. However, ion engines are so efficient, uh, I mean using ion engines and a rapier in this case, but by using the efficiency of ion engines, you don't actually need to do gravity assists at all. If you can tolerate the uh, incredibly boring nature of the ion engines with their incredibly low thrust to weight ratio, then you can do a late SSTO mission without any gravity assists whatsoever. And that was the thesis for this mission here. So I do hope you enjoy the journey as we, uh, as we, as we do it, I guess. Could have scripted that a bit better. Anyway, our adventure begins uh, quite close to the ocean at first. In order to gain the maximum thrust that rapier engine can provide, we need to reach the magical speed of 440 meters per second. So I try and get out, get that out of the way as fast as possible. That's now happened. I am playing back this footage a bit faster than I can talk to keep up with it, but I have done SSTO missions in the past. I've talked to death about ascent profiles, that sort of thing. And I feel like, you know, the speed at which the time lapse is playing, the fact I'm keeping the camera still, and you can kind of see all of the key information as it all happens. I'm hoping I won't need to explain too much. If you want any kind of, you know, a, a timeline of when things happen, you can just watch the footage on screen. I can let, I can let the footage do the talking because goodness knows I don't have the ability to do the talking myself. Anyway, I'm now going to speed up the footage playback quite a bit because the rest of this mission now, up until when we get to Lathe, is going to be done with those four ion engines. That's why our electric charge is depleting very, very fast. And our orbital speed actually seems to be changing at quite, you know, a good rate. It's because this footage is being played back uh, between four times and 12 times normal speed. So that's just one way I'm getting through it. And if you value your sanity, then I would strongly recommend using the mod Better Time Warp like I am going to be doing in this video. Better Time Warp enables you to increase the maximum physics time warp rate from four times to however much you want, but you've got to bear in mind that the higher you raise that rate by, the more susceptible your craft will become to crack an attack. So in this case, I'm using 16 times time warp as my maximum physics time warp. It makes the ion burns go by so much quicker. As you can see, we've got to do quite a few at periapsis because A, our thrust to weight ratio is so poor, we can't reasonably do one uh, to get us all the way to the dual system in one burn. But more importantly, you can see that our burns are limited quite severely by our electric charge. That's why we've got that giant bank of batteries at the front of the craft. I know in theory, our electric charge is infinite because we've got RTGs to continually charge the batteries. But as you can see, the rate the ion engines drain the batteries is much, much quicker than the rate by which the RTGs can recharge them so we have to basically we are limited by the number of batteries we have to do our burns and that's why we couldn't do our Kerbin to dual transfer burn from Kerbin periapsis obviously burning at periapsis is the most efficient place to perform burns such as this but we just don't have the TWR and the electric capacity to do such a burn it takes so long 
on ion engine. So I got as far as I could burning at Kerbin periapsis, and then we'll just have to leave the Kerbin system and do the rest of the burn uh, in deep space. So that's what I'm doing here. You can see we have to do quite a few just to burn, let the batteries recharge, burn again, and just so on and so on. Now here, I'm creating a maneuver node to get ourselves a lathe encounter, but in just a second, I'm going to crossfade across because for whatever reason, and I don't know why, this happened to me a few times as of recent updates. I don't know if it was 1.9 specifically or if it was 1.8 or what, but a lot of the times, if I'm trying to go to the dual system, whenever I make a maneuver node to try and get an encounter with Tyler or Lathe or what have you, it causes the game to just crash repeatedly. I tried so many times with this mission to create a maneuver node that could actually get us a Lathe encounter nice and accurately, and every single time the game would stutter, freeze, and then just completely crash to desktop. Uh, it finally got to the point where it was actually causing my computer to blue screen, where I just said, you know what, I didn't need this in my life. So I just improvised. <laughs> so uh, we got a fairly good lathe encounter, but that's why we got this lathe encounter by doing things fairly inefficiently. First of all, I did a, I think it was an anti-normal adjustment, then played around burning prograde, retrograde, radial in, radial out, etc. Just to get to the encounter I actually wanted. So in case you're wondering why I didn't do a maneuver note just then, because that would have been the sensible thing to do. That's why. But it doesn't matter. All in the past, we have a huge amount of Delta V on board this spacecraft. And while, you know, I was planning on using most of that Delta V, uh, we've still got enough to do a little adjustments like that and compensate for... I guess it's not a Kraken attack because it's actually the game breaking. Uh, but what's more... A Cthulhu attack. It was a Cthulhu attack is what that was. Anyway, here, guys, I must break the bad news that, yes, you got clickbaited. It has, it, you have been clickbaited. I am sorry. I lied to you all. I said that this mission would not feature any gravity assists. But unfortunately, similarly to how we couldn't just do one single burn to get ourselves out of the Kerbin system, I literally just couldn't do a big enough burn. Well, at least, you know, I couldn't burn for long enough to actually capture it lathe in one go. So I'm going to have to do two flybys of lathe to get captured. I don't consider this a true gravity assist, which is why I'm happy to still declare this a gravity assist-less video. Uh, but it means we're going to have to just go up, get another encounter with Lathe, and then continue slowing down at the moon. So I hope it's acceptable. On a similar vein, the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that during our initial escape from Kerbin, I got another gravity assist off the moon. In fact, I got two gravity assists off the moon. But actually, that gravity assist, I would call that an anti-gravity assist because it didn't actually help us at all. It actually slowed us down and cost us more Delta V. And I couldn't, I clearly didn't plan for that to happen. I just didn't plan well enough to make sure it didn't happen. So yes, okay, there is this gravity assist and then there was those two gravity assists off the moon. But again, they don't, they did, the mana gravity assists, they didn't contribute to the mission in any meaningful way. In fact, they were actually quite detrimental to the mission. So I, once again, I'm still happy to declare this. I'm adding more and more caveats to the whole no gravity assists thesis for this mission, but I do, I'm still happy calling it that. Now here you can see me doing this a uh, death spin, just because as you can see, those two temperature gauges at the front of the craft are getting very, very toasty. The reason for this is because I decided it would be clever and really epic of me to put the RTGs inside that fairing piece that sits just behind that shock cone intake. I guess the fairing doesn't actually provide that much thermal protection for the RTGs because during uh, lathe entry and indeed later on for our Kerbin re-entry, uh, those RTGs get very, very hot. In fact, for our Kerbin re-entry, spoiler alert, we're going to be doing it backwards just so that the RTGs are not getting as much heat exposure as they would be if we went in you know, going forwards. So I don't know if it's because the fairings don't provide much thermal protection. What I should have probably done was use the... Uh, the Mark, is it the Mark 1 payload bay? You know, the, you know, the service bay of that diameter part. I probably should remember what the diameters of the various parts of Global Space are, but that, that service bay, I probably should have done that. I don't know if that provides better thermal protection. I think it does, but it weighs more. That's why I went with a fairing. I thought I was being really sneaky, and it turns out there's probably actually a reason that most people who build these sorts of craft use the service bay rather than fairings. Anyway, as you can see, we have touched down on Lathe. Don't worry about the fact that we just uh, glitched through a rock. It's fine. Uh, it's not actually a rock. It's uh, it was a it was a it was a mirage. It was Fata Morgana. Uh, it's just one of the side effects of long-term stasis, which is what Jebediah has been sitting in. You know, we can't have him just sitting there conscious for the entirety of his flight. He'd go insane. So he's been in you know stasis. So I'm just trying to simulate the hallucinations he might be undergoing 
for you guys. Uh, I don't know why I'm dragging this point out so long, to be honest. But it doesn't matter. We've got another thing to talk about now, and that is that Jebediah is finally able to breathe fresh air once again, inexplicably. It doesn't really make that much sense that Lath has the same atmospheric composition as Kerbin. Like, it's got presumably water in the sea. I'm pretty sure, like, the scientific reports say that the oceans of Lath are water, given the fact that Lath is so much further away from the sun than Kerbin. But you know what? Um... I may... Jewel actually is very warm. And I'm pretty sure that's the reason. That's the canological reason. I mean, that was one of the things I wanted to address in my series Life on Lath when that was a thing. Was, um, you know, uncovering the mystery as to why Lath does have an atmospheric composition so similar to Kerbin's. Uh, and it is... It, honestly, everyone asks when's Life on... Where's Life on Lath? When's it coming back? I do want to bring it back really, really badly. But look how ugly Lath is. Man, like, it's not... It doesn't look very good, does it? Especially now that we've seen how good things like Juna and Moho and Eve, etc. have become with, you know, texture updates. I really want to not do anything on Lathe now, or not nothing extensive on Lathe, until it gets a texture revamp, because my goodness, it would look gorgeous. So I want to, I will revisit Life on Lathe, but I would like to do it when Lathe looks, Lathe? <laughs> when Lathe looks a little bit nicer than it does at the moment. Anyway, I have just some, I've just rambled past the actual takeoff from Lathe's surface again, but again, there's not much to really discuss. Just firing up that rapier. I'm not going to be using any oxidizer to circularize. You could actually get a fair amount of speed built up in Lathe's atmosphere without needing oxidizer. In fact, most, most Lathe SSTOs that I build don't actually use any oxidizer burning with the rapiers closed cycle burning. Probably would have been a better sentence just then, but you get the picture. Usually I can just get enough speed up using the air breathing mode of the rapier engine, which is of course the most efficient mode of the rapier engine, and then we can just circularize with our low thrust vacuum engines. And even though we're using very low thrust vacuum engines, the ion engines, they do still provide enough TWR to just about get us into a circular orbit. And this is one of the critical points as to why I needed so many batteries, because I wanted to circularize at lathe purely on ion engines, which of course means we will need a massive electric reserve to ensure that we won't run out of electric charge mid-burn and see ourselves hurtling back towards the surface of the moon. But as you can see, didn't happen. We were all okay. We have now circularized. Lathe's atmosphere ends at 50 kilometers, so easily got enough. Jebediah is going to quickly repack that parachute for no particular reason. We don't actually use it again. I actually did want to use it when we landed back on Kerbin, but it's not actually bound to an action group. I was just using it. I was just using the stage action to uh, deploy it. And since it's now been staged, it won't actually work again unless I bind it to an action group, which I guess we can now do with the 1.9 update, but I forgot. So we won't actually be using it again, but hey, now we, now we just know it's not going to get unravel and, I don't know, get tangled up in any moving part. So it's safe and packed. And now we can just start, we could just start, we could just start burning, right? We could just do a quick prograde burn at Lathe. And in a similar fashion to how we left Kerbin's Sphere of Influence, we're going to do a few burns at Lathe Periapsis in order to get ourselves onto an escape velocity, uh, just because it's more efficient that way. And I know we have an absurd amount of Delta V. We're going to be needing a lot of that to actually slow ourselves down at Kerbin because we can't rely on any gravity assists. And I didn't want to do a similar thing like I did on Lathe and do multiple passes by of Kerbin because that's a bit more difficult to do than it is on Lathe. And I feel like that's a bit too close to the whole, you know, breaching the whole no gravity assists thing. Now here I did this part of the mission I don't want to talk too much about because uh, it, I didn't do a very good job, basically. I've not been feeling 100%, guys. Don't worry, I'm fine. I just have really, really bad uh, hay fever and, like, seasonal allergies. It always strikes around this time of year. I'm aware that I probably sound a little bit more nasal than I normally do, so I'm trying my best to remain as articulate as possible, but that might be why I might be sounding a little bit more, I don't know, different to how I normally sound. Uh, it's because I've got horrible seasonal allergies. My office is very, very warm, and I just wasn't thinking clearly. I, I was thinking, I was just trying to rush this video out. I don't know what happened, but uh, I ended up in a very, very inefficient... I ended up plotting a very, very inefficient route back to Kerbin. We are now at a very, very high height above the sun. We could have done all of this. 
You know, look, I'm having to do a retrograde burn way beyond Joule's orbital height. If I'd just done a simple escape burn just out of the Joule system, we could have then done a much more efficient burn to get ourselves onto a Kerbin encounter. And more crucially, we're going to have to do another burn to lower our apoapsis. We're going to have to lower our apoapsis by quite a fair chunk more because we started out so much higher. So not the best... Uh, planning or my or not the best execution I should say because let's face it not much of this I didn't actually plan any of this I just sort of did it I didn't practice the mission so I was actually sometimes I get quite worried that nothing's gonna work or it's not gonna come together quite as intended when I do these sorts of missions like a lot of these big long-range missions you're watching the first take I know a lot of my uh Kerbal Space Program contemporaries. I mean, I've had chats with people like Strott, some Blitz, and Bradley Wistons, and they all plan their missions obsessively before and i mean that in a the nice sense of the word like they very they plan their missions very meticulously and all that before they actually go and record i just wing it and I'm like ah it did probably work let's just do it and you get stuff like this where actually it was not a very well executed flight but hey that's part of the charm part of the relatability like now you know that if you make a mistake in this flight you will probably be fine and that's the lawn aerospace motto you'll probably be fine <laughs> And it's a great motto for a, a rocket building company. Now, in case any of you are wondering why I did do that giant retrograde burn at our sun periapsis before our initial Kerbin encounter, uh, the reason for this is because at the moment we are going far too fast to uh, circularize at Kerbin using our ion engines. We will enter and leave Kerbin's sphere of influence before we can actually slow down enough using the ion engines. Secondly, we don't actually have enough delta V left with the ion engines to do such a burn anyway. So we're going to have to be doing some aero braking. And, you know, we would be going far too fast to safely aero break, especially now we have the knowledge of just how, you know, fragile those RTGs are inside the fairing at the front of the craft. So that's why I did a big retrograde burn uh, in sun orbit, in our orbit around the sun, just to kill off as much of our velocity relative to Kerbin as possible before we actually get our encounter with Kerbin. You see, the thing when it comes to entering Kerbin's sphere of influence in order to do aero breaks, the closer your orbit is to Kerbin's orbit, the slower the relative speed you will be going relative to Kerbin. Like if we were entering Kerbin's sphere of influence with an apoapsis way up at Joule, we'd be coming in way, way faster than we would otherwise be. So we have now entered Kerbin's sphere of influence. Let's take a look at what we have to work with. We're coming in at just under two kilometers a second this far out. We're going to accelerate quite substantially as we descend towards periapsis. So we're coming in very, very fast. So we can't do much aero braking because we will overheat, especially with the newfound knowledge of just how uh, ineffective that uh, what I assumed would be fairly good thermal protection for those RTGs would be. Turns out they're not very well shielded. So we're going to have to bring a backwards aero brake just here to minimize the heating on the RTGs, which means that our actual aerodynamic profile is relatively slim. Like we're not creating as much drag as I was hoping we would be able to generate. So we're going to have to be doing some retrograde burns with the ion engines, but as always, they have terrible thrust weight ratio. We're probably not going to be able to decelerate enough to capture at Kerbin, and I was adamant that I would not be doing any gravity assists or second Kerbin encounter, so I did a quick cheeky puff with the rapier engine, just use some of our remaining liquid fuel and oxidizer, and as you can see, it was fine. And once again, the Mun is here to ruin our day. We got another encounter with the Mun that we didn't want, so I had to burn a little bit more than what I needed to do in order to make sure we wouldn't be getting another gravity assist off the Mun and get ourselves onto an orbit far too eccentric to recover from. So it means that our periapsis is now a bit lower than I wanted it to be, so you have to do a quick prograde burn, waste even more of our rapidly depleting delta V to correct that. And now we're just going to do some aero brake passes. Once again, we're going to have to maintain a fairly sleek low drag profile to make sure that the RTGs are not being exposed to too much heating. Just in case any of you are interested, we are playing on 100% re-entry heating. We're not playing on any custom value or anything like that. So I can't do much. We're going to have to be doing some, uh, a fair amount of aero brakes. And, you know, since you've already seen me do aero brakes in this video, there's not much I can really add to uh, what I've already said. This gives us the perfect opportunity to do a whiskey review. And today's whiskey review is a whiskey very close to my heart. Uh, it is Jack Daniels, but it's not Jack Daniels old number seven. It is Jack Daniels single barrel select. That's right. You know, a lot of people associate the words Jack Daniels with cheap bourbon. 
And you know, whilst Jack Daniels is, you know, it's not expensive. It's 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 not. It is one of the more budget friendly bourbons. Let's say that. Um, this is a completely different beast. You see, Jack Daniels is merely a brand, but it just so happens that Old Number Seven is so popular that it has become synonymous with the words Jack Daniels. But Jack Daniels Single Barrel Select is the whiskey that they actually put a lot of effort into. It's a bit pricier. In fact, I believe it's the most expensive whiskey I've covered in this series. I Yeah, uh, the only other really expensive one I've covered is Old Pulteney, and I think this does clock in a bit more, typically being about £45 per bottle in the United Kingdom. But let me tell you guys, it is absolutely worth it. I mean, I only ever buy it on sale, to be honest, so I don't ever pay that much. So, you know, it's a fairly pricey whiskey, at least when we're still talking about consumer-grade whiskies. Yes, I know you can spend quadruple digits and even more when you get into the really high-grade stuff, but I ain't, I ain't got the money for that sort of thing. So this, to me, is an expensive whiskey. And it is my favourite whiskey um, thus far that I've had. My palate is not that expansive because... I only really have the whiskies you could buy in a supermarket, so this is what I have to work with. But Jack Daniels Single Barrel Select. I love uh, bourbons, and I do love me the Jack Daniels, even the cheaper Jack Daniels. It's got a, I've got a, I've got a soft spot. It's got a place in my heart. So Jack Daniels Single Barrel Select really ticks all of the boxes. It's got a wonderful taste. You can drink it easily. It has very, very minimal burn. Everyone I show it to, they'll be like, I don't like whiskey, or they've only ever had like you know, JD and Coke and stuff, they don't really like the taste of it. I show them the Jack Daniels Single Barrel Select, and their eyes, they, they open to what a whiskey can truly be. So if you have not, if you don't really like bourbon or whiskey in general, then you, you probably, you might not like it, to be honest, if you really don't like that, the taste of whiskey. But if you want to maybe appreciate bourbon a little bit more, then I would wholeheartedly recommend Jack Daniels Single Barrel Select. And I don't, I've never given this score out before, so you guys know I don't give this out like candy, but I would be happy giving Jack Daniels Single Barrel Select a 10 out of 10 on the Whiskey Review scoreboard. So there you have it, the first 10. And that's not to say, you know, these like 70,000 pound per bottle uh, whiskies are, you know, not as good, or you know, if they're a 10 as well, then they are the same level. There could be lots of whiskies that are a 10. Jack Daniels Single Barrel Select is a 10, there could be others that are 10s, you know, it's just, there's not, I can't conceive of many ways it could be improved. I love Jack Daniels Single Barrel Select, and I'm very happy giving it the 10 out of 10 score. And as you can see, I, I have waffled on about Jack Daniels Single Barrel Select for the entirety of the rest of the descent. So I, I, so I apologize for that. I mean, this must be really confusing now, these whiskey reviews, people that haven't been subscribed to the channel for that long or have seen my last, whatever, five uploads. It kind of started as a joke for the whole copper thing that you've got to make your videos appeal to uh, children over the age of 13 or, you know, adults. Uh, so that's kind of where it stands for. And it's sort of, it's a joke that's been taken too far, really. But anyway, uh, on screen, there is an end screen. <laughs> Left-hand side was a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm. The right-hand side was my most recent upload. Links to subscribe, Patreon, all that good stuff. Description for more. Thank you for watching, guys. Goodbye.